right, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, we are going to be starting in part two of uh, what I began last week, message entitled, I Have Cancer, Now What? It's a, a message, a series designed specifically in mind for those who are struggling with the new realization, uh, the potentially overwhelming news that they have cancer. It's interesting that God ordained it this week. I spoke with three different individuals this week facing brand new cancer diagnoses. I know there's a few others in the body facing probable cancer diagnoses. Um, as I, I shared last week, I am facing my own, a new one, thankfully less aggressive than the cancer I faced a number of years ago. The purpose is that to help you not be overwhelmed in the face of a new cancer diagnosis. But you'll notice that this message and the, the points, the encouragements that I have aren't applicable only in cancer. Uh, as I shared last week, a significant percentage of you will die from cancer. A far higher number will get cancer in your life and get to apply these truths in your heart shepherding. But all of us will face trials ordained by God for our good and his glory. And that, uh, these truths, all of them, I, I pray will sustain you in any number of trials. So last week, I went through the first three points on our outline. We do have, I do have an outline. I think Nick's handing them out, or you can find them to take notes or just pay attention to the screen. Um, we went through the first three points that cancer is not your biggest problem. Sin is. And that before any of this applies, you must apply the gospel to your life, to your cancer. Uh, that the biggest problem is sin a sin that separates you from God, a sin, a sin that puts you at enmity with God, and a sin that won't just destroy your body here, but that would rightly move God to destroy your body in an eternal, unquenching, never-ending way in hell. Second point after you have been reconciled to God in the gospel, having all of his wrath extinguished, poured out on Christ on the cross, now you know that cancer can't kill you, cancer can't separate you from God, and God has purposes in your cancer. We trust God. Thirdly, we embrace the testing of your faith that you find in cancer or any trial with joy because you know that God is accomplishing his purposes in your cancer. And so we ended last week with an extended meditation on rejoicing in trials, understanding that God is totally sovereign and he has a fatherly love for his children. So no trial, no suffering, no cancer is outside of his control. And God has gracious purposes for his children which he, in his perfect wisdom and power, is accomplishing through the means that he ordains. So the be believer can have joy through tears and pain in the midst of trials. This is not easy, but it is the essence of faith. The trial is a testing of your faith a faith that God gave you and a faith that God will sustain. So cling to God. You might hear me say in, in the last point, embrace the testing of your faith. Like You might think that's so unrealistic or you're just calling me to something impossible. I can't possibly have the power to do that. And that's sort of the point, that joy in trial is not something you muster up on your own. It's evidence of faith. And the trial is often meant in God's loving providence 
to bring you to the end of your own strength. But because that faith is from God and toward God, it didn't come from you in the first place and it won't fail. So this is what Paul meant when he responded to Jesus' words. When Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. That's why Paul wrote, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So the point of the testing of your faith isn't your faith, but the object of your faith. Spurgeon wrote, I have the quote so you can follow along. Our life is found in looking unto Jesus, not in looking to our own faith. By faith, all things become possible to us, yet the power is not in the faith, but in the God upon whom faith relies. Grace is the locomotive and faith is the chain by which the carriage of the soul is attached to the great motive power. The peace within the soul is not derived from the contemplation of our own faith, but comes to us from him who is our peace. So trials are one of God's many ways of sanctifying us, of getting our eyes off ourselves and our hope off ourselves and on to him, the object of our faith, the source of our peace. There are many times in our trials, especially in trials that destroy our bodies and sap us of strength when we feel like we don't have the strength to keep going. There, your cancer may be one that is not even that hard to endure yet. Your trial might threaten to weary you spiritually, emotionally, but there are many times where cancer in particular, whether it's the treatment or the effects of the cancer as it robs your body of energy, destroys your organs, or like me, chemo bathing my brain, um, my muscles wasting away. Like I said last week, I had a hard time sometimes finishing an entire sentence of thought. And all I could do was say the words over and over again, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I hope in you. This is what clinging to God is. Paul wrote at the beginning of 2 Corinthians his testimony of God's purposes in his trial. Notice he didn't just say, this is, this is what I did in my trial, but he, he acknowledged God's purposes in his trial. And this purpose is God's purpose towards us in his trial. He has many purposes, more than you can possibly know, but you know this is one of them. We talked last week about one of, your purpo- one of his purposes is your sanctification, your holiness. This is another one. Look at 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Different kind of trial, but I, I, know a, I knew a similar despair. You may too, if not today, one day. Indeed, we had received the sentence of death, but look at what God's purpose was. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And look at the end of verse 10 or in verse 10. On him we have set our hope. Your brain may not be able to wrap itself around how or why God would be taking you through a trial like this. You might wish that you had spent more time before the trial learning theology, maturing, 
And I promise you, if, if you're not yet in that trial, don't waste today. Learn about this God today. Go deep into theology, not so you can pass a test or impress your friends, but so that you know this God on whom you will cling when your very life depends on it. You might wish that you had spent more time learning. You might recognize that your faith isn't all that it should be. Don't worry about that. Just cling to Jesus. I find in that same sermon, it's a sermon from Spurgeon on, on Ephesians 2.8, that I quoted earlier. I'm going to quote again. I love the illustration he has here of, of a limpet, a little crustacean who doesn't know much, but it knows how to hold, how to hold on. This is talking about a child, childlike faith, a faith that just has its focus on the moment and on the one to whom it clings. Spurgeon writes, God gives to his people the propensity to cling. We can cling when we can do nothing else. And that is the very soul of faith. O poor heart, if thou dost not yet know as much about the gospel as ye could wish thee to know, cling to what thou dost know. Cling then. If you don't, if you can't reconcile how a good God can bring suffering, if you struggle with understanding the hows and the why of, of this, how can God superintend pain and suffering for your good? I talked last week about how that, that theology is possible. You can, you can look at the cross and say, I know the same God who is ordaining this for me is my heavenly father and the same God who's ordaining this for my good is Jesus who gave himself for me. And you can trust, but even if you have a hard time reconciling all of that, you can trust, you can cling while your mind gets there, while your faith gets there. Cling to Jesus for that is faith. Just know Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the childlike faith, the mustard seed that will survive this trial. And this is where Spurgeon goes on to give the illustration of the limpet. He says, I do not think the limpet knows much about the rock, but it holds on. A blind man trusts himself with his guide because he knows that his friend can see. In trusting, he walks where his guide conducts him. This is as good an image of faith as well can be. And we know that Jesus has about him merit and power and blessing, which we do not possess. And therefore, we gladly trust ourselves to him. And he never betrays our confidence. So if you find yourself with cancer or any other trial, any other pain, like Paul, don't trust in your strength, boast in your weakness, because when you're weak, then you're strong in him. This is a testing of your faith, and your faith will endure, so in faith, cling to Jesus. And know that God cares. His care does not mean that he will guard you from trials, but he sees, and sees you and sees your pain in them. He sustains you in that trial. He isn't aloof or far off. He knows every tear. He cares for every pain. Psalm 56, 8 speaks, David speaks of God having kept count of his tossings. He says, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? He trusts that God knows them all. He hears your prayers with the attentive, caring, wise ear of your heavenly Father who loves you tenderly, the same heavenly Father who gave his Son for you. His Son, Jesus, is the one who loved you and gave himself for you. 
and one day very soon will dwell with his people. And Revelation 21, 4 speaks of that day. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That one who will wipe away every tear and knows every tear has purposes in your suffering. Cling to him. Trust in him. On to the next point. I could spend the rest of the day talking about that, but then we, I have, I think, nine more points to get to, so we got to move on. Next point, leave tomorrow's anxieties for tomorrow. Turn your Bible to Matthew 6, 34. Jesus was very wise. Obviously, that's an understatement. But when talking about anxiety... Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. And the therefore, we could go back and see about how God provides exactly what you need. He knows. And if he would clothe the grass of the field and he knows what you need, he'll take care of you. The therefore pushes you back. So just know that the therefore of this verse 34 is pushing you back to the, your loving Father who knows what you need and will provide exactly what you need, not, maybe not what you want. And he cares for you. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single span, hour to the span of his life, but Jesus concludes this by saying, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. You hear the world say something like this all the time, one day at a time. There's wisdom in that. But they can't mean by that what the Christian means by that. The Christian, when, when we say one day at a time, I'm just going to endure today. We don't say it resigned to the fact that man, one day at a time, maybe I'll get overwhelmed today, maybe I won't. We say one day at a time, God has promised that he will sustain my faith today. God will give you exactly what you need to endure your trial today. Anxiety comes when we worry about what we're not yet facing you're rarely anxious about the thing that you're facing with that's right in front of you. I mean, maybe that'll get your heart rate up and provide something that feels like anxiety, but that's not the anxiety that the Bible cautions you about. It's vain speculation about the things that might come tomorrow. The reality is the things that might come tomorrow, most of them won't come. It might be worse. It might be better. But God hasn't promised you the grace today to deal with the maybes of tomorrow. God will take care of exactly what you need today. So trust him with today and trust him with tomorrow. But today, let's deal with today. Let's endure today. Let's cling to God today. There's enough trouble. There's enough to drive you to him today without overwhelming yourself with what may come tomorrow. Tomorrow, it'll be today then, and God will handle that day on that day too. So avoid anxiety today with thanksgiving and prayer. Philippians 4, 5 through 7 says, The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That makes sense. If the Lord is near and you're facing something, we already know that God is sovereign over all things. Nothing that you're going to be facing came at you apart from his, permit, his permission, even his ordaining. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That command, don't be anxious about anything. Especially if you're facing challenges like, am I going to die tomorrow? What's going to happen in this surgery? Am I going to have... What side effects am I going to face from this chemo? How's my family going to survive if I can't work? If I die, I don't know if I bought enough life insurance. I don't have workers' comp. I Fill in the blank. You're going to, your, your mind will run to all kinds of things to be anxious for. Is this shot going to hurt? Don't be anxious for it. That might feel like me saying, hold your breath and don't breathe and keep not breathing. You're like, I can't do that. I, I might be able to do that for a second by sheer willpower, but I, I can't keep doing that. God didn't ask you to do this, to not be anxious on your own, like just muster up the strength of faith to not be anxious. But, but what does he do? He actually, at the end of this, promised, he has a promise that will provide the means of not being anxious. Do you see it? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That Jesus grounded and Jesus provided peace that guards your heart actually provides the, it, it fulfills the command, don't be anxious. And what's the means of that? Don't focus on not being anxious. Oh, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious you won't be able to. What do you do instead? When you're facing anxieties, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. As you cling, as you trust, tell God what you need. Tell God what you want. But don't focus primarily on what you don't have. With thanksgiving is the key here. It is very hard to be both anxious and thankful at the same time. And trials have a way of, to the unguarded heart, making you focus on the trial, right? All of those anxieties that I, I mentioned and the ones that you might face, they're, they're generally focused on what you don't have or what you want that you're worried you won't get. Or maybe an experience that, that you're really not looking forward to. Thanksgiving, rather, looks to what God has provided and looks through what God has provided to the one who provided those things. You can thank God for today. Thank God that today you woke up. If you're worried about tomorrow, tomorrow whether you're going to wake up, ask him for that. If you're worried about the bread, tomorrow's meal, the next meal, whether it's going, you're going to be able to find it, whether you're going to be able to keep it down or throw it up because of the chemo. Thank God for the last meal you had. Thank God for his provision that even if your body is destroyed, he has a new one fit for glory. Even if you die, it's just this mortal life, this mor your mortal self being swallowed up in life. It's just temporary. Be thankful for the small things. Be thankful even for all of the, the past blessings as you're asking for future ones. Be thankful. And in your thanksgiving, be thankful to the one who's provided the things for which you are thankful. And then he will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety about tomorrow is also guarded with thanksgiving for what God has provided today and what God provided yesterday, as well as his promises for tomorrow that he will provide exactly what you need Maybe not what you want tomorrow. 
So next point, don't grow weary. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 12. Let's read verses 1 through 4 together. There's a very real danger in trials of weariness. Um, you're going to see that, that word repeated. We won't have time to get into all of it. Um, throughout this entire chapter, you'll see it uh, in verse 5. Don't be weary when reproved by him. Um, the alternative to weariness is enduring, like you see in verse 7. Um, don't grow weary, you'll see, will be the command, or the, uh, the encouragement of verse 3. This section is largely about don't grow weary in your race of faith. Let's just read together Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a, crowd of witness, a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. What is the solution of Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 to weariness? All right, did you see it? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. What do you do instead? Consider him. And you see it up in verse 2 also. Looking to Jesus. In the midst of your cancer, if you have your eyes on your cancer... In the midst of your trials, if you have your eyes primarily on your trials, you'll grow weary, right? Just like in a race, if you don't consider the prize, if you don't consider the outcome, if you don't consider what you're running for, but all you have is, and I'm not sure if I can lift my leg one more time, if I can keep going. If you have your eyes on the pain in your legs, on the difficulty breathing, you'll soon become overwhelmed in the running. But if you look at your teammates who are running with you, and in this case, you look at Jesus, who is the author of your faith. He's the one and the perfecter of your faith. He's the one who gave you the faith that will endure on this race. He's the one into whose form you are being matured on this race of faith. He ran it before you, ran it harder than you. He's more committed to you finishing it than you are. Put your eyes on Jesus. There's a very real threat to weariness. Any time in this race of faith that we're running, there's a very real threat to weary of weariness but especially when your body is weary, there is a threat. Don't stop fighting. And do you see the connection between weariness and sin? The biggest danger to a weariness that will not endure in this race of faith, the biggest danger is not being tired. It's not being sleepless. It's not having a body that's falling apart, but it's giving in to the flesh, giving in to sin. That's why it starts, let's lay aside every weight and sin so closely, or which clings so closely. 
Imagine a runner trying to run a marathon loaded down with stuff, dragging chains and boxes behind him, a weight vest on. That runner will grow weary. Get rid of that stuff. And no matter how hard you struggle to get rid of sin, first it'll be worth it. But no matter how hard you struggle to get rid of sin, no matter how hard you fight, you won't fight against your own sin harder than Jesus did. Do you see verse 4? In your struggle against sin, you haven't yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Who did? Jesus. Against sin, not his own. Against your sin, the author and perfecter of your faith is he who knew no sin but became sin for you so that you might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why verse 7 says it's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Your, Your earthly fathers disciplined you. This is not punishment, but training in godliness. For a short time, it seemed best for them. Verse 10. But he disciplines us for our good. The outcome of this, his purpose is, at the end of verse 10, is so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. It is, it hurts. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. But for those who have been trained by it. Verse 14, strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, verse 12. Eyes on Jesus, endure. But you may find yourself, and this is the next point, embrace help. You may find yourself at a point where your strength has come to an end in your weariness, or you're not sure you can go on in weariness, particularly a a weariness. We find like, I can't even pray anymore. I'm not sure I want to endure. If so, call for help. Turn, Turn to James 5, 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Your translation might say, and maybe a, a, a more complete word, a better word here might be weak. It, it can be a weakness that, that comes from, from being sick. But you can be sick and strong. It, it, the, the, the focus here is not on, uh, you know, do you have a cold or even do you have cancer? This isn't, um, hey, call and, and get healed from your physical illness. The focus here is, is prayer, a closeness to God that will endure in holiness in the midst of weariness. Is anyone among you weak or weary? That's how that word is translated in every other epistle. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Call for help. If if you're suffering, pray. And if you're so weak, so weary that you find that you can't even pray, you don't want to endure, call for help. And elders, go. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, caring for the physical needs, getting their tears on your shoulder. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is weary. That's a different word. It might be translated sick for you. That's even a different word. That's the same word here as is in Hebrews 12, so that you don't grow weary. The 
Prayer of faith will save the one who is weary, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. If you find that you cannot pray, that you don't want to endure, that you're having a hard time persevering in your faith, call for help. And if you get that, that call, go. Help that one endure in faith because he repents and he turns to the Lord in faith in the midst of his weariness that, that might be coming in the, the face of very real physical suffering. The Lord will raise him up. It doesn't mean that he'll heal him from his sickness, but he'll help him persevere in his faith. Therefore, what's the antidote to this weariness that might keep you from being able to pray even? What's the antidote? What's the, the protection? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I don't have time to go into all of it, but just know this is what's in view here is not primarily so that you would be healed from your, or not even in view, that you would be healed from your cancer. But I might have in mind that you'd be healed from the deadening effects of sin. By his stripes you've been healed, that, kind, that sense. Just trust that God has purposes in your trials. This is the same book that started with count it all joy when you face trials because the testing of your faith will produce endurance. And it ends, if your endurance is failing in the testing of your faith, get help. Get help, get help now so that you can endure in faith. And if you find a brother, if, if you see somebody wandering from the truth, not persevering at the, in the face of a trial like this, and they call for help, go. My brothers, at these, the book ends, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and the context here is in the face of immense suffering, you wander, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. If, if you find yourself at facing a trial that may be the end of your life, even, and you find that your faith isn't enduring, call to God for help. Say, God, I believe, help my unbelief. And reach out to your church for help. I can't pray. Will you pray with me? Help me pray. And then don't rely on their prayers. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. And help each other limp across the finish line with our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Next point, prioritize the church. Obviously, this last point will tell you, you, you can't run this race alone. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to face this cancer on your own. You are an indispensable part of the body, even if you can't function in the way you used to in the body. God, who saved you to be a part of his body, gave you his spirit, gave you a gift, and ordained the way that Grace Bible Church is put together is the same God who ordained your weaknesses. You might not be able to function in the body in exactly the way you wish you could function in the body or the way you used to function in the body. I used to be able to go out and serve, meet all these needs. Now I can't even get out of bed. That doesn't mean you're useless in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body, we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater 
modesty. There was a long time where my family, we, we couldn't be present with the body. But we were still part of it. Due to cancer, there are a number of people in our body who can't be here on a Sunday. They have a hard time gathering. They seem to be weaker, and yet they are indispensable. Don't forget them. And if you are them, prioritize the church as you can. Recognize in faith that you are still a part of the church. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God has purposes in your cancer, not just for you, but also for the church, for his church. And in your cancer, through your cancer, you have the opportunity to live out being part of the body of Christ. Maybe not in the way you hoped, or the way you would prefer, but in the way that God has designed. Don't neglect that. You may find that you have a lot of time alone. You have time to pray. You can encourage others through your faith and perseverance, but not if you don't let them see it. So allow others to care for you. Like James 5.16 says, confess sin to one another and pray for one another. Maybe if you're alone, send text message, messages of encouragement, write letters of encouragement. Allow visitors if you can. Don't, well, while you're alone, here's a temptation. You're alone in bed. It's so sad. So many hospital beds. People, I, I work in hospitals, and you see people at the, some of their most desperate moments in life, numbing away the pain with frivolity of entertainment. Don't use technology to numb you with mindless entertainment, but to connect you to God's people and resources that will sustain you, whether it's sermons, audiobooks, good messages, even better, FaceTime. Church, don't forget those who aren't present with us. You know, your cancer might not be one that keeps you alone. It might not be one that keeps you separate. Maybe you just have to endure coming to church, having pain, maybe having a week of trials that others can't appreciate. You know what those trials have prepared you for? All week, as you've seen the weakness, as you've clinged to Christ, they've prepared you for the good works that God has for you as you come together as the body. You've maybe had your eyes on Christ out of necessity the whole week, and maybe somebody has had everything going right all week, and they come in. They come into church, and God has ordained you to speak to them. And because you have been walking by the Spirit all week long, out of necessity, just out of the, the sheer need to survive, you are well positioned to care for them on Sunday. The unshepherded heart will let cancer drive you into yourself to think about yourself. The well shepherded heart, knowing that they are a part of the body, will think about the body rather than yourself, and that will drive you to self selflessly serve. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. You might think I have all kinds of excuses to not meet. I have cancer. I'm tired. This was a hard week. I got chemo tomorrow. <clears throat> 
but encouraging one another, rather than neglecting, encouraging one another, and all the more as you say, see, see the day drawing near. So when you have cancer, you're more aware of that day, I hope, than ever before. The reality is gathering may have some unique challenges for you. It might even be impossible at times. We can still work really hard to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Consider hard how to encourage. Don't let cancer have you prioritize things over the church, which you are individually members of. Similar point, Think of others selflessly. I love Paul's perspective in 2 Corinthians of his suffering, and we can learn much from him. 2 Corinthians 1, 6, and 7. If we are afflicted, he wrote to the Corinthians, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you, also, you will also share in our comfort. Our, our situation is different than Paul, but your heartbeat should not be. And John Piper says it well. He says, we waste our cancer if we let, us, if we let it drive us into solitude instead of deepening our relationships with manifest affection. We waste our cancer if we let it drive us into solitude instead of deepen our relationships with manifest affection. Cancer is humbling. Some of its side effects can be embarrassing. But don't allow these excuses to drive you into secluded privacy. Consider, even in your cancer, not how to merely be the recipient of encouraging, uh, of, of how to, to encourage one another, but you, in your cancer, as you're suffering, consider others selflessly. How can you even encourage them? And you will not be able to do it in solitude or if solitude is your aim. If one member suffers, all suffer together. It's hard for us to suffer if people don't know about it. Doesn't mean you need to broadcast all your suffering. Woe is me, get the attention on me. That's not the point. But you can actually think of others as you humbly let them in to your suffering. And as God sustains you in your cancer, you will be an encouragement to Christians around you you'll also be able to give very real testimony of Christ to those who don't yet know him. There is no more potent evangelism than an evangelism where you're proclaiming as your only hope the one that you are so obviously clinging to as your only hope. When a religious or irreligious person sees something in you sees a sustaining of faith in you and an endurance in you that obviously didn't come from you. God can use that. In chapter 11 of, of Don't Waste Your Cancer, I'll just read it. There's, uh, I can't summarize it better than just reading it. We waste our cancer if we fail to use it as a means of witness to the truth and glory of Christ. Christians are never anywhere by divine accident. There are reasons for why we wind up where we do. Consider what Jesus said about painful, unplanned circumstances. They will lay your hand, their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. So it is with cancer. This will be an opportunity to bear witness. Christ is infinitely worthy. 
here is an oppor- a golden opportunity to show that he is worth more than life. Don't waste it. Remember, you are not left alone. You will have the help you need. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and the glory of, to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4:19. So look through cancer to Christ. Cancer is just the path set before you. Thinking back to Hebrews 12. Cancer is just the the path, but don't look at the cancer. Look through it. Look to Jesus and consider him. Our highest hope is not a cure. God has not promised that you will live cancer-free or trials-free. Sometimes our suffering is at the hands of others, like persecutions, or sometimes, like cancer, they're the result of living in a groaning, sin-stained world. But our sufferings are always ordained by God and should always point us to him. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you, as though something strange were happening but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. And Peter opened that book written to suffering saints, showing how trials, especially trials that might kill you, are designed by God in the gospel to prove genuineness of faith, to point you to heaven, guard you into eternity, and thereby bring glory and honor to Jesus and to stir love for Jesus in your heart. In this you rejoice, verse 6 of 1 Peter 1. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by, by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice in your trial with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Piper again. Great book, Don't Waste Your Cancer. If you have cancer, you should buy it. If you don't, you should buy it. It's just a little booklet. It says, cancer does not win if we die. It wins if we fail to cherish Christ. God's design is to wean us off the breast of the world and feast us on the sufficiency of Christ. It is meant to help us say and feel, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and to know that therefore to live is Christ and to die is gain. In your cancer, talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. This is what, uh, I I think the best example of this is, is or my favorite example is Lamentations 3, 21 through 24. All around the author are sufferings. He writes in that chapter, this is what it feels like. It feels like the Lord is against me. It feels like these sufferings will not end. It feels like God's not keeping his promises because his, his city is in ruins and his people have turned against him and committing unthinkable acts just to survive. And he goes, this is what I feel, but it's not real. This I call to mind. And he starts preaching truth to himself. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Talk to yourself. When yourself is feeling overwhelmed, 
when you're feeling beaten down, when you're feeling like God is against you, say, self, trust in the Lord. He is good. His steadfast love never ceases. Jesus loved me. He gave himself for me. If God would give his own son for me, how will he not with him give me all things I need? If he's for us, who could be against us? And keep going and going. Talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. And finally, anchor your perspective in eternity. It's wise to think regularly about death, whether you have cancer or not. One of the sweet things about cancer is that it might be the way you die. And it's wise to think about how short life is in comparison to eternity. Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. And there is something especially sweet amidst the bitter pain when we see our bodies in which you might be tempted to trust falling apart and our earthly tent being destroyed. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And it goes on. 2 Corinthians 5. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due, what he is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. In 2 Corinthians 4.14, when you're thinking about dying, Remember that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us all with him and bring us into his presence. Remember, even if you die, cancer doesn't win. Cancer may be the way that God separates you from this body, swallowing up the mortal with life. Cancer may separate you from this world, but your citizenship was never here. I'll end with Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things, including cancer, to himself. God, thank you that cancer cannot win, that sin does not win, that you win, you reign, and we can trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.